In the last occasion, we were discussing the manner in which one of the strongest southern Indian powers was ultimately defeated by the British in 1799. And we also made this point that the defeat of Tipu in 1799 was the prelude to a far more important transformation in central Indian politics in the course of the subsequent two decades when the Maratha polity eventually accepted uh, British hegemony, supremacy, uh, signed treaties of capitulation and ultimately the Peshwa lost his power or he was pensioned off and the entire territory that was ruled by the Peshwa from Pune uh, was uh, acceded to the British Empire. So this was a very important uh, development in the territorial expansion of British Empire in India at the turn of the 18th century. So we are actually trying to explain the long-term and the short-term reasons for the eventual failure of the Maratha polity to continue the resistance that they had occasionally put up against the British. Part of the answer has already been given in the discussion on Mysore. We have already seen how Tipu's plan to combine many of these Indian powers, the Nizam, the Marathas together in a kind of a grand coalition against the British ultimately found it. It didn't succeed, partly because of this constant enmity among them. So there is a story within Maharashtra as well. I mean, uh, the, the reason for the collapse of the Maratha polity has been assigned to certain long-term changes in the character of the Maratha state. So we have some points to make about it. Secondly, we have to talk about the way factionalism within the Pune court or factional rivalries among the great Maratha leaders which tried to carve out their independent power basis in other parts of India, in the central India, in Gujarat, in eastern India, because as you know, Raghuji Bhosle extended Maratha control as far up to southwest Bengal. Uh, Orissa became a part of this extended Maratha frontier. But uh, that didn't resolve the problem and these Maratha leaders were actually frequently clashing with one another. There were frequent intrigues at Pune, which made the situation more difficult. And lastly, as a result of these factors or these internal problems uh, within the Maratha polity, it became easy for the British to intervene in Maratha politics and uh, they achieved fair amount of success say, between 1770s and um, 1818 when the fate was sealed. Uh, finally, we have to make a few points about how the defeat of the Marathas actually ushered in a new kind of imperialism. So, do you think the over-expansionist policy of Marathas to a certain extent responsible for their defeat? Of course, you have hit the nail on the head. I mean, in the long run, we have an explanation that the extension of territory beyond the natural frontier was responsible for the creation of uh, a large Maratha confederacy, which the imperial center at Pune was unable to control. In order to appreciate the changes that took place in the nature of Maratha state in the course of the 18th century, you have to go back a little backwards in time. The state that Shivaji created was a kind of a regional state, but it was different from the Mughal successor states. It was based on the loyalty of the Maratha peasantry and the Maratha warrior classes. So it is suggested that this regional state actually derived its sustenance from a certain regional consciousness, a regional identity, or the kind of support that the Maratha warrior classes and the gun-bearing peasantry had provided to Shivaji's regime. This regime, as you know, fought continuous wars with Bijapur on the one hand and with the Mughals. Shivaji died in 1680. And after Shivaji's death, this continuous war with the Mughals weakened them somewhat, but at the same time, we see that in the course of the 18th century, there was a change in the character of the state. 
uh, even as it is true that the house of Sivaji became increasingly insignificant with the rise of the Peshwa. I mean, Balaji Vishwanath was that prime minister who served Shahu, who returned from Delhi and took over uh, power in uh, Satara. But uh, Pune was the ultimate headquarter from where Balaji Vishwanath began to control the Maratha regime and the Marathas began to expand, began to expand northwards. And this expansion reached its height around the middle of the 18th century under Bajirao I. And Bajirao I, as you know, uh, went as far up to as Rajasthan, occupied Malwa, uh, came to Delhi. So this northward expansion created certain territories in central India, which the Maratha Sardas came to control. It is often suggested that if the Battle of Panipat hadn't happened, if the Maratha army remained intact, if there was not a power vacuum after the Battle of Panipat, as you know, uh, Nana Sahib Peshwa Balaji Bajirao actually died within a few weeks after the disastrous defeat at Panipat in the hands of Abhut Shah Abdali. Uh, and uh, even then, it is suggested that the Marathas reasserted their power in North India again. And there is this great example of Maharaj Sindhya once again trying to retrieve Maratha power in North India, coming to Delhi, control the empire, control the emperor took seized power from Najibuddala, the Afghan upstart. So, over-expansion uh, certainly was actually weakening the control of Pune over these great Maratha leaders who eventually were carving out their independent spheres of influence in central India, North India and Gujarat. As you know, Maharaja Sindhya was initially located Ujjain but then once Malwa became the main territory under his control, he moved upwards mm -hmm. towards Gwalior. You have Holkars at Indore, you have Bhosle at Nagpur, and as you know, Raghuji Bhosle and his successors moved towards the east, so that Urissa became a part of their territory. And then you have the Gaikwads at Baroda. So it was certainly difficult for the authorities in Pune and the family of the Peshwa, which virtually seized power from the house of Sivaji, pensioning of the house of Sivaji at Satara, ruling this large Maratha polity, this extended polity from Pune, or trying to create some kind of federation of these powerful Maratha leaders. But I would argue that the even then, it might have been possible to keep this polity together if Pune remained fairly strong. So weaknesses at Pune to a large extent were responsible for the failure to maintain a certain kind of balance, uh, a balance between the imperial center at Pune and the various satraps that were emerging in the northern and central India. In this connection, I want to ask a question, sir. Wouldn't you think that the failure of the Pune authority was due to the fail of the um, Peshwa's family itself? To a large extent, yes. The split in the Peshwa family was to a large extent responsible for the failure eventually to control these powerful regional satraps elsewhere in central India and Gujarat. And there is a history of this kind of factional rivalry within the Peshwa family since an earlier time. Uh, you know, it became uh, much more pronounced and prominent from after the defeat of the Maratha army in 1761. I was mentioning that in 1761, on the battlefield, some of the important family members died. Sadasiv Rao Bhav the younger brother of uh, Peshwa, Nana Sahib Peshwa, uh, died in the battlefield along with Nana Sahib's elder son, Vishas Rao. Then you have uh, the succession of young Madhav Rao uh, as Peshwa. But Madhav Rao's uh, Peshwa ship was contested by his uncle, Raghunath Rao, known, popularly known as Raghoba. And eventually Raghoba and... Uh, Madhav Rao came to some kind of an agreement and they fought together in a war against Nizam. Uh, but Madhav Rao ultimately decided that uh, he was not in a position to fight out 
uh, the power hunger of uh, Raghunath Rao. So they came to some kind of an arrangement by which Raghunath Rao managed to retain his importance at Pune, constantly intriguing against uh, Peshwa, establishing links with powerful members at the Pune court, trying to cultivate support from uh, the members of the Maratha aristocracy. By then, all of these great Maratha leaders were in command elsewhere in central and northern India. So, the aristocracy itself became divided. Some were behind Raghunath Rao, some were behind Madhav Rao Peshwa. So, this was the situation till 1773 when Madhav Rao died. It is often suggested that if Madhav Rao lived for some more time, the Maratha Empire, the future of the Maratha Empire would have been more secure, but that's a matter of speculation. But uh, if, you, if we take the facts fact straight, then we find that after Madhav Rao's death, you have this continuous frequent uh, eruptions of what we may call factional rivalries at different moments of succession. Uh, Madhav Rao was succeeded by his younger brother Narayan Rao, whose life was made difficult by Raghunath Rao, who had his ambition to become the Peshwa. So, but there was a rival camp led by a man called Nana Farnavis. Farnavis was a clerk during Madhav Rao's regime, but Nana Farnavis from now on would become much more important in Pune politics, controlling the affairs in what was known as Peshwa Daftar. Uh, so Nana Farnavis's camp in Pune was actually pitted against Raghunath Rao, and all these great Maratha leaders were lining up against one another. As supporters of Raghunath Rao or as supporters of Nana Farnavis's choice, who was the posthumous son of uh, Narayan Rao. In the meanwhile, Narayan Rao, as you know, was murdered by Raghunath Rao's instigation. The main strength of the Peshwa family was the kind of family unity. But this family unity broke up. Uh, the family split, particularly because of Raghunath Rao's ambition to become the Peshwa. And uh, the entire story, eventually Raghunath Rao didn't succeed because he tried to cultivate a close uh, relationship with the British, tried to use their power uh, in order to become the Peshwa, entered into an agreement. That agreement was rejected by Calcutta authorities who tried to try fish in troubled waters. So, such was the situation that would invite the British. It invited British intervention around 1775, 1776, 1777, and that was the time when the first Anglo-Maratha war was fought. Then it invited British intervention once again in 1795, when the Peshwa died and a new succession trouble broke out in 1795 at Pune. Uh, that was the time when Bajirao II became the Peshwa. But once again, there was a contest. Some Maratha leaders wanted to prop up someone else against Bajirao's legitimate claim and you have the occasion ready for the British to make their intervention. And that was the time when a new kind of imperialism was actually slowly raising its head. And imperialism yeah, represented by a man like Wellesley who would like to intervene more directly, more powerfully in the affairs of the Indian states. So I think that the split in the Peshwa family, the constant intrigues in Pune, the rival claimants for power, all these were certainly responsible for certain major weaknesses in Pune, for which reason it was difficult for Pune to hold the Maratha Empire together. But the crucial turning point, of course, was the another succession dispute in 1795 that I was mentioning. After Bajirao II became the Peshwa with the support of a certain group, but uh, and once he became ba the Peshwa, Bajirao II tried to contain Nana Farnavis's power. So there were once again intrigues in Pune. There were um, rival uh, leaders of the Maratha aristocracy, the leaders of the Maratha confederacy lining up against one another. So that was the time when there was a significant change uh, in British policy as well. Because Wellesley represented a more assertive imperialism. Sir, what was this new imperialism all about? This had something to do with the change from a kind of policy of non-intervention. 
the non interventionism that was practiced earlier have was related to relative weaknesses of imperialism because the more you are actually engaging in wars the more you are involved in military expeditions you are spending money and an east india company which is basically a business organization would not actually uh, like to lose money because of this kind of warfare but wellesley represented a different vision of imperialism wellesley felt that whatever may be the consequences for the financial uh, well being of the company it is important for the british to establish their empire and that was this new imperialism and this was synchronizing wellesley's arrival in india his attempt to create a new policy to pursue a new policy synchronized with a fresh bout of conflict in the pune court one set of people would be backing up one claimant for power the other set of people will back up another claimant of power so it is in this context that the intervention took place took place because holkar was actually seizing pune and faced with this kind of an adversary the peshwa the new peshwa bajirao the second sought british protection and as he sought british protection the british got the opportunity to intervene and this was the second phase of war and when after this phase the british were great winners they were forced of the these maratha leaders to sign several treaties of capitulation the several treaties which were known as the subsidiary treaties you are all aware of this system of subsidiary alliance that wellesley was trying to create 1799 was the date when nizam also signed this subsidiary treaty 1799 was the time when uh, the mysore sultanate was wound up by because of uh, the defeat of tipu and this was also the time when a major intervention took place in maharashtra the second maratha war uh, when the british were trying to protect the peshwa uh, as their protege against a set of maratha leaders especially holkar and then after achieving this success largely due to the grand military victory of the lord lakes army treaties were imposed on each of them sindhia lost chunks of territories in malwa and as sindhia signed the treaty of capitulation the subsidiary treaty british had control over malwa the british had control over gujarat so this i think was a very important turning point turning point in the history of british expansion in maharashtra for all practical purposes maharashtra was under their control either through their control over the peshwa or through their kind of treaties that they were they have forced the maratha leaders to sign settlement of 1803 these treaties provided some amount of stability under british control for about a decade although at times lawlessness broke out because under british direction both the sindhya and the holkar had to demobilize their army and the demobilized soldiers of these two armies actually became the pindari bands who turned dacoits and these pindari bands created a lot of lawlessness in the region but 1813 another very important turning point in the history of british imperialism when lord hastings of moira became the governor general and he was not happy anymore with the subsidiary treaties he inherited wellesley's imperialism in a more uh, aggressive form and lord hastings of moira wished to intervene in all of these states more directly so a system evolved or certain arrangements were made by lord hastings whereby bajirao the second became a ruler without a power without any power i mean he was peshwa but he had no power everything was subject to ratification by the british overlords or british uh, residents there so the peshwa made a last ditch effort to fight another war and it they failed the last maratha war which happened as a consequence of the attempt by lord hastings to clip the powers of the peshwa almost totally by making him completely useless or completely powerless in his own house in his own state and 
the consequence was the last war in which Peshwa managed to mobilize the Pindari bands or some soldiers against the British. Most of the Maratha leaders stood aloof except Holkar who came to intervene at the very last moment. In the war, the Peshwa lost. He lost his power. He lost his Peshwaship. He was pensioned off and the entire territory which had been governed by the Peshwa became a part of the British Empire. So it is important to locate this very important change that was taking place in British imperialism. The British imperialism was becoming more aggressive, more interventionist. And the first indication of this interventionism was seen in, in the close of the 1790s when Wellesley was there. And then uh, later, once Hastings of Myra continued that policy after a period of non-interventionism, imperialism came to, uh, to, to what may be called, this was a full-blown empire that was created by 1818. So that is the significance of the settlement of 1818. You see a new imperialism. And this new imperialism was not merely uh, territorially significant because once the Marathas were defeated, once the British became so confident about their power, they began to embark on a new policy, a new policy of westernization, new policy of changing India, a new policy which was trying to establish the presence of the British in India more prominently, more pronouncedly as reformers, as civilizers in the Indian context. The defeat of the Marathas in 1818 was also, as you know, synchronized with the publication of one of the major texts of this new imperialism of James Mill's History of British India, which actually announced the arrival of a new policy whereby the British never, just didn't wish to rule India but wished to create a new West by imposing the westernization, by westernizing this uh, country. So this is what I actually mean by uh, new imperialism. But it had other implications as well. Uh, in economic life, for example. Sir, what was the consequence of the defeat of the Marathas? The one important eco economic consequence of the final defeat of the Marathas was the rise of Bombay. Uh, Bombay had been certainly a British port in the region, but Bombay was uh, not so uh, prosperous. Uh, Bombay didn't flourish, even in the 1790s. So that Cornwallis, for some time contemplated the winding up the Bombay establishment or maintaining it on a very small scale. Opium from Bombay was exported to China and it was through this export of opium that Bombay began to flourish from now on. So during the 1820s, the expansion of Bombay, the rise of Bombay as a major port actually was a consequence of the defeat of the Marathas in 1818 because a large hinterland was now available to Bombay port including an hinterland in which opium was grown in Malawa, in Sindhya's territory, the British tried to ensure the supply of Malawa opium to Bombay so that Bombay port began to flourish. So there are consequences. So let us actually recapitulate the whole thing. We first wanted to make this point that the, there were structural problems. I mean, the Maratha polity became so large that the imperial center at Pune um, failed to hold on, failed to hold the polity together. Then we try to make the point that the main reason why the British were able eventually to intervene in Maharashtra, intervene, uh, um, ultimately managed to create their power base at Maharashtra was the division, the division among the leaders, among the Maratha Sardars, among the satraps, regional satraps and also within the Pune court, which invited British intervention, enabled the British to prop up their protégés and eventually the final uh, curtain was drawn between 17, late 1790s and 1818 when a new kind of imperialism which sought greater territorial expansion, which tried to establish British presence more powerfully in South Asia, changed the balance altered the entire story and changed the balance against the Marathas.